You know, a year ago, I was still working on my first video. Back then, I was experimenting and everything I was doing was playing by ear and trial by error. My computer constantly crashed because I overwhelmed the CPU and little by little, I crawled a little further to finishing my first video. And I did not expect to garner the audience that I did. I said this in an earlier video, but I, yeah, I did not expect to get even 500 subscribers, let alone 3000. And now we're here and I'm starting one of my most ambitious projects yet. I wanted to do something impactful for Black History Month. Because I'm a history channel, it seems right to cover certain events and people on certain anniversaries that are relevant to them. And for Black History Month, I thought, okay, then let's do something special for this. For those of you who are new to my channel, what I do here is I take a historical figure or event that has been depicted on screen several times and determine which one is the best, as well as looking at the common themes and misconceptions that have risen around this subject over the years and their definitive moment, which you can almost always find in their on-screen portrayals. My policy is always that the event or person needs at least five on-screen incarnations in order to warrant a rankings video, but I don't tend to include documentaries or parodies, mainly because the parodies are an exaggerated version of events, and with documentaries you don't really see the whole thing. They're there to enhance the documentary itself and the lesson we're learning from it, and you only see snippets of it every now and then. So for Black History Month, I was thinking maybe I could do something similar. Perhaps I could take a look at Martin Luther King's on-screen incarnations, or maybe Harriet Tubman. But I kind of realised there are so few famous black figures, be they African-American, Afro-Caribbean, Afro-British, or just African, who are frequently passed over when it comes to getting their stories on the big screen, or on television, or even in plays or musicals or video games. That doesn't seem right. Plus, we're all aware of the controversy surrounding the Academy Awards for constantly ignoring non-white actors and filmmakers. But clearly, there is no shortage of stories that can be adapted and nominated and possibly even win. In which case, I've decided to break away from my format and I'm dedicating 10 videos to 10 remarkable people. Some you may have heard of, some you may not have heard much about, and some whose stories you may know, but not the full story. These are people who don't have a movie or TV show starring them, but definitely deserves one. Or, if they do have an on-screen counterpart, it falls short of what this person deserves. Or they're made to just sit on the sidelines as supporting characters, and may have been adapted several times, but never actually get to start as the main character, and usually are the supporting character to a white person. I want to use my online platform for something good, and should this project prove successful, I would like to donate a portion of the ad revenue earned during October to Black Lives Matter. I'm not black, but I want to use what resources I can to contribute to changing the world for the better. It's not just up to non-white people to tackle racism. Those of us who haven't faced discrimination or bullying because of the colour of our skin have to do our bit to contribute to reforming. It is important for all people to understand the importance of black history, especially over in America where Republicans seem so dedicated to rewriting history and preventing children from realising that anyone but white people exist. I bet you didn't know that ice cream wouldn't be as awesome as it is now without Augustus Jackson. Come on. The purpose of these videos is to have an educational value. And I'd like to keep them tame enough, so if you have a child in school and they're looking to do a project about Black History Month or they're just wanting to learn about Black History, then you can show them these videos. So I promise I won't swear, and even if some quotes contain racial slurs or otherwise inappropriate language, I won't say them out loud. If you want to be with me as we go through this, then please make sure you subscribe to my channel and hit the bell so you're notified of every single upload I make. I will have the comments monitored to prevent any form of hateful language being shared on this channel. When I came up with the idea of doing mini biographies for black people who have made great strides in history but have gone overlooked too long, the first person who came to mind was Mary Seacole. 
She was a Crimean nurse who tended to British soldiers on the battlefield and refused to be turned away from helping people. The Crimean War of 1853 to 1856 is famous for many reasons, but usually the first individual person you think of, especially if you were raised in Britain, is Florence Nightingale. But in all the television shows my teachers sat me in front of, all the educational videos made by the BBC, None of them mentioned Mary Seacole until Horrible Histories came along and brought her to light. These days, acknowledgement of Seacole's contributions have gained more traction and she has been granted posthumous honours since. Mary Seacole was born in Kingston, Jamaica on 23rd of November 1805 as Mary Jane Grant. Her father, James Grant, served in the British Army as a lieutenant and was from Scotland. Her mother was a free Jamaican black woman who is only known as Mrs. Grant. She had a reputation in Kingstown as the Doctress. This was a term given to a female healer in the Caribbean where they would attend ailments using an array of herbal remedies that were passed down from generation to generation, as well as being a midwife and tending to injuries. Mary's mother was also the owner of a boarding house called Blundell Hall. While Mary was learning the trades of herbalism and nursing, the practice of good hygiene and cleanliness while treating patients was already well established among doctresses for at least a century before Florence Nightingale arrived in the Crimea. However, your average white male doctor still did not take cleanliness seriously. Being multiracial and a child of the Caribbean, Mary dubbed herself a Creole, wearing both her Scottish and Jamaican heritage like a badge of honour. She received a good education from an elderly woman who Mary dubbed her kind patroness. This meant that she had high social standing, despite slavery still being prevalent in the Caribbean. She was confident and independent, even at a young age, visiting London twice on her own before she was 20. Mary and her mother were often recruited by the British Army to produce their nursing skills in several places in the Caribbean, including Cuba and Haiti. In this time, slavery in the British Empire was abolished. In 1836, Mary Jane Grant married a merchant named Edwin Horatio Hamilton Seacole. Hence, Mary Grant became Mary Seacole. They were married for eight years before Edwin died. He was already rather weak when they were married, and having such an accomplished nurse for a wife helped him last a little bit longer. Not long after, Mary's mother died and she had to rebuild Blundell Hall after it burned down. In the wake of these personal tragedies, Mary dedicated herself to working as a doctoress and a business owner. In 1850, there was a cholera epidemic in Jamaica and Mary was one of the many nurses who treated the sufferers. Blundell Hall was a popular place for members of the British Army who were outposted in the West Indies. When Mary went to visit her half-brother Edward in 1851, who had moved to Panama, cholera struck the town. Mary did not waste time in treating the victims. She would only charge the rich patients for her services. That way she could afford to treat the poor for free. Mary herself contracted cholera as the epidemic began to lift. In 1852, the worst seemed to be over. At a leaving dinner, a white American man encouraged his fellows to thank Mary for her work. But then he added that it was a shame she wasn't all white, but at least she wasn't completely black. And if there was a chance that they could bleach her skin and turn her white completely, it would make her acceptable in any country. Mary stood up and calmly replied that she did not appreciate the remarks towards her complexion, as she would have been just as useful and proud of herself if she was completely black. Then added that she drank to the men and the reformation of American manners. She was stopped from taking an American ship back to Jamaica and had to wait for a British vessel instead. The Crimean War began in October 1853 and anyone who has heard of the Crimean War knows of the horror that was waiting for the troops. Injured soldiers would be sent to a hell on earth in an overcrowded hospital, which was unsanitary to say the least, where someone with an open wound would have to sleep on the floors which were covered in human feces. You could survive being stabbed or shot on the battlefield, but infection would always be waiting for you. Florence Nightingale was the head of a detachment of nurses who were sent to assist with the overcrowding. Meanwhile, Mary Seacole decided to travel to London and apply officially with the War Office. Despite bringing several testimonies of her experience, she was rejected. She rightfully wondered if this was because of her race. Regardless, Mary would not be refused. Using her own resources, she travelled to the Crimea. If she could not be employed with other nurses, she would work independently, and she formed a partnership with her acquaintance named Thomas Day. When Mary arrived in the Crimea in early 1855, she visited the hospital at Scutari where Florence Nightingale was working. 
While things were a lot better than they used to be in the hospital, Nightingale and her nurses would be very distant from their patients. Bedside manner was far more formal back then. Mary and Florence met for five minutes, where Mary asked for a bed for the night. The next day, Mary travelled to the British camp on the front lines of the war. There, she hired local labour to build a mess hall called the British Hotel out of Driftwood. It was here that she sold food, cooked and gave medical care. She would go out onto the battlefield and tend the wounded. Like in Panama, Mary would only charge the richer patients so she had money to tend the poor. On 30th March 1856, the Treaty of Paris was signed and the Crimean War officially ended two days later. With the soldiers leaving in their droves, Seacole had tons of provisions that she couldn't sell. She had to auction her excess stock to the Russians returning home, but at a loss, and she left the Crimea in July much poorer than when she arrived. Mary Seacole returned to London where she was declared bankrupt in November of 1856. She received four medals, though they weren't officially given to her. Rather, they were purchased to show her solidarity with the soldiers she protected. Her financial struggles were highlighted in the press, where she received donations to save herself from poverty. She lived in cheap lodgings in Soho and was denied a chance to go to India to assist with the Indian Rebellion of 1857. In July of 1857, a fundraising event began in her honour, named the Seacoal Fund Grand Military Festival. This was supported by both soldiers and officers, but Seacoal only received £57 out of the festival's profits. In the meantime, Seacole wrote her autobiography, titled Wonderful Adventures of Mrs Seacole in Many Lands. This was the first autobiography written by a woman of colour in Britain, and she was not without influential friends. Prince Victor, Queen Victoria's nephew, carved a bust of her in 1871, and she became the personal masseuse to the Princess of Wales. Mary Seacole died on 14th of May 1881, leaving most of her money and possessions to her sister. As she had converted to Catholicism in later life, she was buried in St Mary's Roman Catholic Cemetery in Kensal Green. Mary Seacole's story languished in obscurity following her death. Salomon Rushdie refers to her as a prime example of hidden black history in his infamous book The Satanic Verses. And for good reason, seeing as how her actions in the Crimea saw so little reward and Florence Nightingale, by contrast, was made world famous. Herbalism itself is considered a lost art, as the spread of Western medicine has dismissed remedies that the Caribbean doctresses lived by. From the 1950s onwards, there have been efforts to reinstate the significance of Seacole's contributions. Her tombstone has been restored in Kensal Green Cemetery, and she has a blue plaque in Soho Square where she lived after the Crimean War. Blue plaques are a pretty big deal in Britain. You are guaranteed to find one on the birthplace or residence of a famous historical figure, especially in urban areas. She also has a nursing school named after her at the Thames Valley University, and a statue of her now stands outside St Thomas's Hospital. In 2004, on a list of 100 Great Black Britons, Mary Seacole was voted number one. Her portrait, which was made in her lifetime, now hangs in the National Portrait Gallery opposite Florence Nightingale. As far as on-screen adaptations go, Mary Seacole has only been depicted in documentary reenactments, as well as two sketches in BBC's Horrible Histories by Dominique Moore. The first sketch was basically her listing only a fraction of her achievements, and the second is one of many, many awesome songs that came out of the show's original run. It's a parody of Beyonce's All the Single Ladies, and to be honest, I like Mary Seacole's version more than the original. And that is the story of Mary Seacole. I hope you enjoyed the first of these many, many biographies for Black History Matters Month. Next time, we'll be going across the pond to the Olympic champion of 1936, Jesse Owens. If you like this video, please give it a like and share it round to stop the algorithm from burying it. I want to be demonetized as little as possible this month. And I know that can be very tricky when you're a history tuber and you're talking about history that doesn't involve white people.